Hello everyone, and today we'll be going over Hannah Arendt's book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Chapter 12, entitled Totalitarianism in Power. Now this is a build-up from the previous chapter, which was about the pre-power stage of totalitarian movements. Now we're going to talk about what happens when totalitarianism gains power of the country. According to Arendt, when totalitarian movements get power of the state, there's a paradox that arises. It's because the totalitarian movements have always relied on their ability to move without any obstructions. However, the state, with its laws and with its boundaries and territory, is one of the most static things that it has ever had to deal with. Even more so, when totalitarian movements get power of the state, they need to start dealing with real objective circumstances, because they're the ones in power. And this adds even more tension to the fictitious world that it's trying to create. Quote, Power means a direct confrontation with reality, and totalitarianism in power is constantly concerned with overcoming this challenge. According to Arendt, in order to get by this, totalitarian movements need to adhere to a type of government that most resembles a Trotsky statement called a permanent revolution. Totalitarian movements aren't just happy once they get power of the state, they're an international in scope, and thus they can't create stable institutions in the state itself. It must keep moving as it did in the pre-power stage. To do this, it doesn't establish itself as the stable authority over the state, but instead it subsumes the state itself in order to achieve the kind of prophetic doctrines that it had put out in the beginning of the movement. Thus the state machinery that it takes over is not no longer used to govern the people, but it's used as a tool in itself to get to establish the means to the end of the totalitarian movement. Now the Nazis and the Soviets did this in different ways. The Soviets established a permanent revolution by instilling general purges amongst its populations. According to Rent, the first purges were made towards targets who were thought to be in the deep state of the Soviet Union. But when the movement became more aggressive and more totalitarian, the purges uh, basically chose from more of a general public than any one single enemy. This purging within the party made it such that there was no stable structures that could remain. For the Nazis, the permanent revolution took a different form. Instead of cleansing the party through different types of people, it chose specifically cleansing of certain racial people. It was those people who were not of the German or the Aryan race, or those people who were sick with some disease that they needed to get rid of. Quote, the point is that both Hitler and Stalin held out promises of stability in order to hide their intention of creating a state of permanent instability. Again, any form of stability within a totalitarian movement acts as an obstacle that will later prevent the totalitarian leader from doing what he needs to do at that moment in time. Thus, the totalitarian ruler must both establish the fictitious world as a tangible working reality and prevent this new world from developing any sort of stability. Any sort of normalization, anything that lasts in the fictitious world is seen as something that's an obstacle. Quote, the moment revolutionary institutes become a national way of life, totalitarianism will lose its total and become subject to the law of nations, according to which each possesses a specific territory, people, and historical tradition, which relates to other nations. And this is totally against the ideology of totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is not a national movement. It's international in scope. It doesn't see itself as relating to nations as countries. Instead, what it's fighting for is not any kind of patriotic act, but the fact that they're doing something that could only happen once in every 2,000 years. They see themselves above countries. According to Arendt, this permanent revolution that totalitarianism establishes when it gains power is done in three primary ways. First, it uses the state administration as a way to make global conquest. Second, it establishes the secret police force as a means towards transforming the reality into the fictitious world. And lastly, it erects uh, concentration camps as a means towards um, experimenting and using kind of a laboratory setting to determine how best to total domination can be achieved. And when we say total domination, we don't mean taking over the world as in taking over all the countries. Again, 
this movement is sees itself above all nations. It doesn't see kind of countries as they are. What total domination means is the total domination of every individual to kind of deprive every individual from the ability to act and speak. It aims to reduce every individual to a tamed animal. A domination that strips each person of her personhood and plurality of character. For only a totalitarian movement can rule with unthinking, yielding sympathizers. We'll get a little bit more of this later, but first let's talk about the state machinery. According to Arendt, common sense tells us that once a revolutionary party gains power over a country, it will lose its kind of utopian aspects. Everyday business, working as the country, should uh, moderate its pre-power kind of claims that it had used it to uh, gain uh, support from the masses. When you're a revolutionary party, it's very easy to criticize the authority, to use your imagination to come up with ways to rile up the crowds. But once you're faced with uh, objective conditions that you're bound to as an authority, you can no longer kind of use these uh, utopian arguments. And using common sense, this is what the non-totalitarian world expected. However, this was anything but the case. Instead of re-entering into the comity of nations, these totalitarian regimes became even more hostile, something that contradicted common sense. If anything, now armed with the kind of machinery of the state, these totalitarian regimes became even more hostile. Even the sympathizers were confused, according to Arendt, because they expected the Nazis or the Soviets to establish a new code of law or new state institutions to implement what they had been talking about. But according to it, none of this happened. And what the Nazis did was that they increased the amount of terror to quell any sort of political opposition. In fact, the amount of terror and violence that the Nazis used is inversely proportional to the amount of internal political opposition, which means that the less internal political opposition, the more force and the more terror that they used. Now this is a complete assault on common sense. If the reason to use terror and force is to quell internal political opposition, then if the opposition goes down, then you shouldn't be you shouldn't have to use as much terror. So the question becomes why the increase in terror? In a speech given to the SS leaders in 1943, Himmler says, "We have only one task, to carry on the racial struggle without mercy." We will never let that excellent weapon, the dread and terrible reputation which preceded us in the battles for Kharkov, fade, but will constantly add new meaning to it. Thus, terror wasn't used as a means towards establishing a political dominance within a country. Terror was used to achieve what the totalitarian movement had set out to in the beginning, to exterminate inferior uh, races. Thus, when the Nazis took power, they only saw state as the resource to continue doing what it wanted to do. The laws and uh, the institutions were really not useful for them at all. This is why, according to Rent, they left most of the civil services intact once they gained power. But this sounds contradictory because the institutions are stable units, something that can't be moved, that the totalitarian wants to move, so why not just get rid of them? According to Arendt, the keeping intact of the traditional political institutions of the country actually gave hope to non-totalitarian countries that it would be a check on power of the uh, Nazi movement. But since the Nazis had little concern for law altogether, the institutions really didn't provide any check on power uh, at all. When a totalitarian movement wants to get something done, it doesn't enact a public law. It has a decree that is only internal and known within the party, and it executes that with certain functionaries of the party. The fact that the laws are not public means that the citizens of the country don't even know when they transgress the law. A decree could be sent down within the internal groups of the party that claims that something is no longer allowed or some people is an enemy, and one day you could just have the police knock on your door and arrest you for reasons that you would have not known at all. According to Arendt, although there were no new laws that were really passed, it felt as if a comprehensive reform had happened in Germany.
And since there were no written down laws, the secret police, the people who executed what the um, decrees of the party wanted, did so not by the actual decrees, but because they were uh, interpreting the will of the Fuhrer. The Soviet Union also had a similar relationship to the laws and the power within the country. Their constitution of 1936 is described as a veil of liberal phrases and premises over the guillotine in the background. In this way, totalitarian movements like the Nazis and the Soviets had a dual authority. You had the ostensible power of the state, which was actually just like a fake kind of facade, and then you had the real hidden power, which was within the party. The state, which was based on constitutional laws, was merely just a facade for the non-totalitarian world to convince the non-totalitarian world that the totalitarian regime was in some ways normal. But in reality, the state and the laws were a completely ostensible authority. The real power resided in the hidden machinery of the party and the movement. In an opening speech at the Nuremberg Trials, Justice Robert H. Jackson backs up this claim. He says, Two governments in Germany the real and the ostensible. The forms of the German Republic were maintained for a time, and it was the outward and visible government. But the real authority in the state was outside of and above the law and rested in the leadership corps of the Nazi party. This divide between the state and the party is also expressed by jurist and professor uh, Reinhard Hohen. He says, and there is still another thing which foreigners, but Germans too, had to get used to. Namely, that the task of the secret state police was taken over by a community of persons who originated within the movement and continued to be rooted in it. That the term state police actually makes no allowance for the fact shall be mentioned here only in passing. Thus, the real power within the totalitarian regime rested in the secret party groups like the secret police. Arendt describes this as a process of duplication. Before the totalitarian uh, regime gained power of the state, the power rested in the state. In order to transfer power from the state to the party, the party made groups that duplicated the functions of the state. But the duplication doesn't start there, according to Arendt. Once the power resides in the party and groups within the party, those institutions within the party are duplicated again. And this is the process that Arendt calls multiplication. So if you have a group within the party movement that has a certain power, eventually that group will be duplicated and the new power will rest in the other group. But the previous group that was duplicated won't be told that it has lost power. And this process continues and continues and there, there's many groups within the uh, totalitarian regime that feel like they have power, but it's very ambiguous. Quote, in the early period of the Nazi regime, immediately after the Reichstag fire, the SA was the real authority and the party the ostensible one. Power then shifted from the SA to the SS and finally from the SS to the security service. This shifting of a power, according to Arendt, is characteristic of totalitarian regimes. For the citizen under the power of the totalitarian regime, the shifting power creates confusion. The citizen doesn't know who to obey. According to Arendt, Germans needed to develop a sixth sense at any given moment to obey the right authority, or else they would be caught in the terror itself. According to Arendt, this confusion and shifting of power within the party organization was essential in order to make sure that there was no consolidation of power in any one group. This made sure that there were going to be no obstacles for when the party wanted to do something, nothing got in its way. This multiplication of offices within the party inexorably creates conflict of responsibilities between these groups. Quote, the inhabitants of Hitler's Third Reich lived not only under the simultaneous and often conflicting authorities of competing powers, such as the civil services, the party, the SA, and the SS. He could never be sure and never uh, explicitly told whose authority he was supposed to place above all others. This confusion wasn't only limited to the citizens, but also to those in the party organization. The decrees that were passed down to these groups weren't detailed. They weren't explicit as to what one should do. This vagueness signaled to the recipient that he ought to recognize the intent and act dutifully without question. 
Each of these groups weren't connected in a hierarchy, but instead they all felt that they were representing the will of the Fuhrer. They had a direct connection to the Fuhrer. And thus, when an order was passed down by the Fuhrer, it was their job to interpret the will of the Fuhrer in doing uh, and completing that action. So to restate, within a totalitarian organization, we have multiple different offices that are conducting very similar functions because they're all duplicates of one another, and they all receive similar orders of which they each interpret differently. Even more so when these orders are conducted and they're conducted against citizens, the citizens don't know which one to obey and their sixth sense or uh, who they determine to obey is going to determine whether they live or die. In a sense, it's very Kafka-esque where you have this bureaucracy where there's no really right way of doing things. There's no common sense that's involved. Instead, what's important is what is necessary at the given moment in the given time. According to Rent, the point is that each organ of power is never deprived of its right to pretend that it embodied the will of the leader. Even though the SA resented its loss of the rank to the SS, they felt directly connected to the leader. When Hitler told them, all that you are, you are through me, and all that I am, I am through you alone. This multiplication of offices was very important to be able to shift the power between the party organization so that it was never static. And thus, the longer the totalitarian regime stays in power, the more offices that will be created. It's characteristic of totalitarian movements to continue to shift where power resides. Only the leader can confer power onto organizations, and his continuance of granting power without acknowledging the loss of power of the previous organizations led to multiple authorities believing in them having power over the same responsibilities. Quote, the result that up to the end of the regime, there were not one, but two national socialist student groups, two Nazi women's organizations, two Nazi organizations for university professors, lawyers, physicians, and so forth. And amongst all these organizations, it was nebulous as to who actually retained power and authority. At any given point in time, no one could predict with any assurance which party organ would rise to the ranks of the internal party authority. It was only the will of the Fuhrer that would be able to collapse this wave function and determine the actual authority at any given moment in time. Now the trade-off here is that since we have multiple groups doing the same functions, there is high inefficiency. But this is only secondary for totalitarian movements. What's most important is the leader's ability to shift power within the organization such that there's no obstacles for the movement to do what it wants. Quote, shapelessness turns out to be an ideally suited instrument for the realization of the so-called leader principle, a continuous competition between offices whose functions not only overlap, but which are charged with identical tasks, gives opposition or sabotage almost no chance to become effective. Again, according to the leader principle, all power resides in the leader. There is no hierarchy in which power is filtered down to different groups. In addition, there's no intervening levels between certain party groups and the leader. All party groups feel like they're directly connected with the leader. Quote, therefore, it is not accurate to say that the movement after its seizure of power found a multiplicity of principalities in whose realm each little leader is free to do as he pleases and to imitate the big leader at the top. This relationship of power is most conspicuous, according to Arendt, with the leader's relationship with the police chief. Himmler, the, the chief police of the Nazis, had no ambition to take over power over Hitler. However, this lack of absolute power of Himmler doesn't uh, prevent or preclude him from continuing the totalitarian uh, principle of duplication. Himmler added the secret service to the service of the Gestapo. Uh, the regional offices of these organizations maintain their own identities. And during the war, Himmler continued adding two intelligence services, inspectors to control the security service and the intelligence bureau, which took over military intelligence. According to Rent, what motivates totalitarian movements isn't the lust for power, but instead to gain complicity among all individuals within the movement. This might explain why we didn't really see a palace revolution when the Nazis took power. These totalitarian movements aren't run by cliques and gangs who want to achieve power over people and want to demonstrate that power. 
totalitarian movements only work when all people in that movement are completely socially atomized and thus have no way for creating any sort of stable structures within the movement. This lack of any ruling groups within the movement creates a baffling situation for when you have a successor to the leader. So who, who leads the Nazi movement when Hitler dies? According to Arendt, if the leader has done his job correctly, then it doesn't really matter who takes the reins. It's because the totalitarian uh, should have already reduced every individual to a complicit individual, and thus whoever is in charge doesn't really need to do any special work. So long as the overall machinery works properly, then it should just work out. Quote, the multiplicity of the transmission belts, the confusion of the hierarchy, secure the dictator's complete independence of all of his inferiors, and make possible the swift and surprising changes in policy for which totalitarianism has become famous. According to Arendt, the multiplication of offices within the party organization destroys any sense of responsibility or competence. It hinders productivity because multiple organizations are conflicting with each other to do the same job. It makes any sort of reliable teamwork impossible. Why this isn't important for totalitarian movements is because they get their money a different way. Quote, economic laws of investment and production, of stabilizing gains and profits, and of exhaustion do not apply if one intends in any event to replenish the depleted home economy from loot from other countries. Thus, the economic engine of Germany is not important for the sake of uh, funding the war. It's because you can, uh, when you go to war, you can pillage the enemy land that you conquer and thus kind of continually supply yourself. Arendt even implies that the reason why Hitler went to war so early on is that he couldn't achieve the party's mission for the elimination of the Jews without the resources of all of Europe. In his diary, uh, Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels wrote, The war had made possible for us the solution of a whole series of problems that could never have been solved in normal times. The Jews will certainly be the losers. In this way, the Nazi party was anti-utilitarian. The economy came second. The primary task, the thing that was important, was to complete the job of the extermination of the Jews. Thus, instead of using the state as a means towards economic gains, it used and subsumed the state as a means towards uh, actualizing its ideologies. Its rise to power in Germany was only meant to be a temporary headquarters. Again, this movement is international in scope. It must use the resources of Germany to expand even more. In fact, according to Arendt, the Nazis didn't even believe that the Germans were the superior race. This was only propaganda used to uh, get, gain intrigue amongst the masses. The Nazis instead believed that the master race were the Aryans. That was still a race that was centuries in the future. They saw their movement as merely a precursor to the uh, origin of the Aryan race. The movement was meant to prove that it was possible to fabricate a race. According to Arendt, this behavior of the leader is entirely new that hasn't been seen before. No leader has been willing to pillage uh, every kind of economic resource and every kind of country uh, in order to uh, fulfill a specific ideological doctrine. Thus, when they gain power, the totalitarian movement doesn't really reorganize itself at all uh, in relation to the pre-power stage. The division between party members and fellow travelers organized in front organizations leads to the coordination of the whole population who are now organized as sympathizers. The tremendous increase in sympathizers is checked by limiting party strength to a privileged class of a few million and creating a super party of several hundred thousand, the elite formations. Multiplication of offices, duplication of functions, and adaptation of the party sympathizer relationship to the new conditions means simply that the peculiar onion-like structure of the movement in which every layer was the front of the next more militant formation is retained. The state machine is transformed into a front organization of sympathizing bureaucrats whose function in domestic affairs is to spread confidence among the masses of merely coordinated citizens and whose foreign affairs consist in fooling the outside non-totalitarian world. 
And finally, the leader in his dual capacity as chief of the state and leader of the movement, again combines in his person the acme of militant ruthlessness and confidence-inspiring normality. The one difference between the totalitarian state and the pre-power stage is the significance of the leader's ability to lie. According to Arendt, the lies were not as accepted once the leader was in power, so he had to uh, create any even greater lies to maintain support. Thus, Hitler had to resort to an old-fashioned nationalism, arguing against the Versailles Treaty as justification to the rise of power. Everyone in the movement knew that this was a lie. It was meant for the people in the non-totalitarian world. Quote, systematic lying to the whole world can be safely carried out only under the conditions of totalitarian rule, where the fictitious quality of everyday reality makes propaganda largely superfluous. Only those who are ideologically convinced of the movement will carry out orders without question. Lies are for everybody else. According to Rent, to understand the true aims of the movement, you're better off reading Mein Kampf than listening to the speeches that Hitler gives to a constitutional body. Again, this line constitutes the difference between the ostensible state facade and the real internal power within the party movement. According to Arendt, the totalitarian dictators knew the danger in uh, creating nationalistic policies. To overcome this, they consciously did exactly the opposite of what they said that they were going to do. Quote, instances are too obvious and too numerous to be quoted. This tactic, however, should not be simply identified with the enormous lack of faithfulness and truthfulness, which all biographers of Hitler and Stalin report as outstanding traits of their character. According to Rent, the Bolshevik and Nazi literature was obsessive about uh, global domination. However, this desire is not completely decisive. Quote, what is decisive is that totalitarian regimes really conduct their foreign policy on the consistent assumption that they will eventually achieve this ultimate goal. Any foreign policy wasn't directed towards countries that were not a part of the movement. It was directed towards countries that the Nazis saw that would eventually be a part of their movement. Quote, Nazi law treated the whole world as falling potentially under its jurisdiction, so that the occupying army was no longer an instrument of conquest that carried with it the new law of the conqueror, but an executive organ which enforced a law which already supposedly existed for everyone. Thus, a totalitarian movement seizes power just as a foreign conqueror would take control over a country. He governs the country not for its own sake, but as a means towards some end. And all of the looting that is done is not uh, a means towards improving the life of the population or increasing the growth of the country, but it, again, it's a means towards actualizing the doctrines and the desires of the movement. According to Arendt, the trouble with totalitarian regimes is not that they play power politics in a ruthless way, but that behind the politics is an entirely new concept of power. Quote, supreme disregard for immediate consequences rather than ruthlessness, rootlessness and neglect of national interests rather than nationalism, contempt for utilitarian motives rather than unconsidered pursuit of self-interest, idealism, i.e. their unwavering faith in an ideological fictitious world rather than lust for power. And these drives are all reinforced through the conscious organization of the totalitarian movement. Stalin saw every institution as a transmission belt connecting the party with the people. He believed that the true riches of his country were not the material resources, but the organization of unthinking individuals. German journalist Konrad Haydn writes, Look at these laughing eyes, this fanatical enthusiasm, and you will discover how a hundred thousand men in a movement become a single type. Thus Hitler didn't consider the war to be lost when German cities were in rubble, but instead when the SS uh, organization no longer became reliable. Quote, the structuralists of the totalitarian state, its neglect of material interests, its emancipation from the profit motive, and its non-utilitarian attitudes in general, have more than anything else contributed to making contemporary politics well nigh unpredictable. And this unpredictability is what baffled the non-totalitarian world. Now, it's important to note that totalitarian domination is much different than a party dictator domination. In party dictatorships, uh, the party seeks to fill all the seats of the office with its own members. In this way, it doesn't change the power uh, balance between the state and the party. The power still resides in the state. 
Totalitarianism, on the other hand, leeches power from the state itself through the process of duplicating offices of the state into party member organizations. Quote, above the state and behind the facades of ostensible power, in a maze of multiplied offices, underlying all shifts of authority and in a chaos of inefficiency, lies the power nucleus of the country, the super-efficient and super-competent services of the secret police. The job of the secret police is to execute orders in order to transform reality into the fictitious world. Even before totalitarian movements gain power of the state, there are multiple existing entities of secret police forces in multiple countries. These secret police forces aim to uh, change the country in a way such that when totalitarianism does arrive in that country, the leader will feel at home. This possibly explains why when Germany took over France in World War II, the state police were very amenable to the Nazi state police. And again, unlike a military that is fighting a foreign enemy, the police see the current uh, country that they're in not as a foreign enemy, but as people who should already be obeying the law and will of the Fuhrer. According to Arendt, however, the job of the secret police to uh, prepare the country for a totalitarian state is only their secondary function. Instead, the secret police go through multiple stages of executing orders that give the fictitious world a sense of objectivity. In the first stage, the secret police target and exterminate any sort of political opposition. And according to Rent, as the political opposition decreases, the amount of state police increases. This makes the secret police force seem superfluous. Why have so many people when the political opposition is so weak? The only rationale that makes sense to the secret police is that there is some other secret resistance out there that is hiding, and it's only a matter of time until their job will become useful. Quote, the first stage of ferreting out secret enemies and hunting down former opponents is usually combined with drafting the entire population into front organizations. It is in this first stage where the neighbors uh, within a totalitarian regime have more suspicion than at any other time. Quote, it is during the stage that a neighbor gradually becomes a more dangerous enemy to one who happens to harbor dangerous thoughts than our officially appointed police agents. Thus, the presence of the secret police is not even necessary in order to maintain control. A constant suspicion between neighbors is what keeps everybody in check. Any possible involvement with a suspect would mean that it is your life. After this first stage of eliminating political opposition, the next stage is to target something called the objective enemy. According to Arendt, the objective enemy is an abstract category of people that the leadership chooses to be the enemy. For example, the Nazis might choose that the objective enemy today is the Polish Jews, and what this means is that the secret police is given the order to find anybody uh, who is a Polish Jew, regardless of how guilty or innocent they are. This is different than any other previous secret service methods, which is used to find information on people as a way for suspecting them of crimes. Instead, at the outset, these people need to be rounded up, not regardless of how guilty or innocent they are. They're rounded up not for any one reason, but because the leader says it is a necessity. Quote, practically speaking, the totalitarian ruler proceeds like a man who persistently insults another man until everybody knows that the latter is his enemy, so that he can, with some plausibility, go and kill him in self-defense. Thus, if Hitler says the enemy is the Polish Jews, the enemy is the Polish Jews, the enemy is the Polish Jews, eventually when he does uh, target and kill the Polish Jews, he'll give the reason that, oh, it's because they're my enemy. And the reason why uh, they choose certain objective enemies and not one specific race is because once they're done eliminating a certain race, they don't want things to return back to normal. The abstraction of an objective enemy makes it such that they can transfer that title onto any certain race to continue uh, the exterminations. According to Arendt, the leader's choice of the objective enemy is not arbitrary at all, but instead the enemy must be plausible, and it takes the people from whom um, there is already antagonism from the masses, such as the Jews. Quote, the concept of objective opponent whose identity changes according to the prevailing circumstances, so that as soon as one category is liquidated, 
a war may be declared on another, corresponds exactly to the factual situation reiterated time and again by totalitarian rules, namely that the regime is not a government in any traditional sense, but a movement whose advance constantly meets with new obstacles that have to be eliminated. Unlike in a despotism where the secret police acts like a state within a state, in totalitarian movements the state merely acts as an executive function. It's no longer discovering uh, suspects and crimes, instead it's merely finding a certain group of people that the leader wants to eliminate. According to Rent, they have sunken down to the role of the executioner. Just like other institutions within the party organization, the secret services is also duplicated. Quote, the efficiency of the police consists in the fact that such contradictory assignments can be prepared simultaneously. Just as totalitarian movements make the suspect now into an objective enemy, they also make the suspected offense into a possible crime. In normal circumstances, a man might be arrested because he is suspected of a certain crime. However, in totalitarian movements, a man can be arrested for the possible crimes that he might do. It's not what he's done, but what is in the imagination of those who are arresting him. In this sense, totalitarian movements believe that everything is possible, and thus, if a crime is conceivable, then it's punishable. There is one aspect between the despotic police and the totalitarian police that is the same, and that's the way that they finance themselves. In the middle of the war, Himmler said to his men, we have the moral right to wipe out the, his Jewish people bent on wiping us out. But we do not have the right to enrich ourselves in any manner whatsoever, be it by a fur coat, a watch, a single mark, or a cigarette. In a world where any possibility of thought can be considered a crime, every thought that deviates from the officially prescribed decrees can be made into a justification for one's arrest. Quote, simply because of their capacity to think, human beings are suspects by definition, and this suspicion cannot be diverted by exemplary behavior for the capacity the human capacity to think is also a capacity to change one's mind. Thus in the world, suspicion dominates all social relationships. It creates an all-pervasive atmosphere, even without the physical presence of the secret police. Quote, in a system of ubiquitous spying, where everybody may be a police agent and each individual feels himself under the constant surveillance, every word becomes equivocal and subject to retrospective interpretation. According to Rent, after the police have eliminated the objective enemy, uh, the last stage happens, and this is a stage of arresting anybody. In this stage, victims are chosen at random. Quote, this new category of undesirables may consist, as in the case of the Nazis, of the mentally ill or persons with lung and disease, heart disease, or in the Soviet Union, uh, of people who happen to have uh, been taken up in that percentage, varying from one province to another which is ordered to be deported. These victims who are chosen aren't punished as criminals per se, but instead are treated as, the, as if they had never even existed. And according to Rent, this is the most difficult task of the secret police. In order to make someone disappear, they also must make sure that all that the relations of those people also disappear. If the Gestapo had the databases of people that we have today, you can only really imagine what they would have been able to accomplish. And according to Rent, the ability to understand all the relations of a given person uh, is the utopian ideal of the secret police. Quote, now the police dreams that one look at the gigantic map on the office wall should suffice at any given moment to establish who is related to whom and in what degree of intimacy. And theoretically, this dream is not unrealizable, although its technical execution is bound to be somewhat difficult. According to Rent, it was of the utmost importance that once these people were arrested, there was no more word that was ever spoken of them. Any information that was leaked outside of the party was seen as something that was inconsistent, and inconsistency within the movement uh, breaks apart the fictitious world. Quote, the anonymity of its victims, who cannot be called enemies of the regime and whose identity is unknown to the persecutors until the arbitrary decision of the government eliminates them from the world of the living and exterminates their memory from the world of the dead, is beyond all secrecy, beyond the strictest silence, beyond the greatest mastery of double life that the discipline of conspiratory societies use to impose on their members.
According to Rent, in this way, the secret police represent a secret society who has a certain knowledge that no one else does, and they act on this knowledge. The secret knowledge is the will of the Fuhrer, who is to choose a particular enemy and to eliminate that enemy. And so long as the pol secret police have this information, they are considered elite within the organization. Quote, their real secret, the concentration camps, those laboratories in the experiment of total domination, is shielded by totalitarian regimes from the eyes of their own people, as well as from all others. According to Arendt, when uh, the Nazis committed crimes, they made sure to make their crimes gigantic. They did this because it's hard to really believe uh, when a crime is so large and horrible. It's hard to rationalize it. Quote, normal men don't know that everything is possible reduced to believing their eyes and ears in the face of the monstrous, just as the masked men did not trust their theirs in the face of a normal reality in which no place was left for them. It puts people in a trance, basically thinking that the world is just kind of this weird fictional dream. And so finally we get to the concentration camps, and again according to Rent, these concentration camps are treated as laboratories for experiments to determine how to achieve total domination over people. Total domination, again, means the elimination of any plurality or unique qualities of an individual. That kind of character that, of, that each individual has to put something new into the world. Arendt compares this with Pavlo's dog, who is uh, conditioned not to eat when the dog is hungry, but instead uh, conditioned to eat when the master rings a bell. This elimination of human plurality could not happen in the normal world. This is why the fictitious world of the Nazis is so important. The fictitious world is so eminent and powerful that uh, Arendt cites letters from survivors of the camps uh, saying that they were unable to really comprehend what was happening around them. The survivor, when he returns to the world of the living, is assailed by doubts with regard to his own truthfulness, as though he had mistaken a nightmare for reality. The immensity of this crime makes it feel like it, w it could not have ever happened. It's that horrible. Quote, the very immensity of the crimes guarantees that the murderers who procl proclaim their innocence with all manner of lies will be more readily believed than the victims who tell the truth. Thus, when we confront the Holocaust, when we try to think about it, we can't really grasp it. We have some kind of way of trying to reason how it could have happened. Yet, it's so horrible that it's hard to believe that any reason would really justify how it could have happened. Quote, in each of us there lurks such a liberal wheedling us with the voice of common sense. This idea that the uh, means justifies the end, that what we do is determined for some end that is r realizable and uh, inherently good in some way. Quote, what runs counter to common sense is not the nihilistic principle that everything is permitted, which has already been contained in the 19th century utilitarian concept of common sense. What common sense that normal people refuse to believe is that everything is possible. That when we try to think of what happened in concentration camps and try to enter the minds of the victims and the SS men who ran the camps, we try to think of it psychologically, and yet we can't really fathom how it could have happened at all. The truth, according to Arendt, is that the psyches of these men, both the victims and the SS men who are running the camps, was destroyed. Quote, the end result in any case is inanimate men, men who no longer uh, be psychologically understood, whose return to psychologically or otherwise intelligible human world closely resembles the resurrection of Lazarus. When we try to use common sense to understand what happened in the concentration camps, we think of it as this kind of superficial thing. It makes us not want to dwell on the actual horrors that happened. But according to Rent, it's important for us to be able to understand how to dwell on these horrors in order to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, Rent also thinks that dwelling on the horrors is not enough. It's because we can't really look back and live through these experiences. We can read reports, but even the reports try to rationalize what happened. Quote, writers are so much aware of the terrible abyss that separates the world from the living, from that of the living dead, that they cannot supply anything more than a series of remembered occurrences that must seem just as incredible to those who relate them as to their audience. Thus, according to Arendt, dwelling on the horror really can't change the characteristic of man. It can't really combine to unify a political community. 
Quote, the fearful imagination has the great advantage to dissolve the sophistic dialectical interpretations of politics, which are all based on the superstition that something good might result from evil. Such dialectical acrobatics had at least a semblance of justification as long as the worst that man could inflict upon man was murder. However, we're not talking about murder here. We're talking about mass murder. And according to Rand, it's even more than mass murder. What happens to those people in the concentration camps is that they're lost of any status as a person or a human. They're completely forgotten from the surface of the earth once they enter the camps. According to Arendt, the real horror of the concentration camps is the fact that the inmates are fully cut off from the world. Their murder becomes an impersonal as squashing a gnat. Quote, it is as though he had a story to tell of another planet for the status of the inmates in the world of the living, where nobody is supposed to know if they are alive or dead, is such that it is as though they had never been born. Unlike slave labor, the inmate of the camp has no value. He's not adding to anything, he's not building anything, and he's completely replaceable because there's always more people coming in, basically replacing him so that his death really means nothing. According to rent, concentration camps in this time period fall into three different categories. The first category is represented by Hades, which is a mild form of uh, putting people who are suspected of a crime but have not been yet proved of the crime and are mostly amongst the stateless people. According to Rent, the second category is purgatory, and this relates to the Soviet Union's use of concentration camps in which there is a neglect and combined with forced labor. However, the Nazis' uh, concentration camp is the third category and is conceived as hell, in which the whole of life was thoroughly and systematically organized with a view to the greatest possible torment. The common thing amongst all of these camps is that they seal off populations of humans and treat them as if they no longer existed. Quote, it is not so much the barbed wire as the skillfully manufactured unreality of those whom it fences in that provokes such enormous cruelties. The difficult thing to understand is that this happened in a phantom world that is completely divided from the real world. It was a place where man was tortured and slaughtered, and neither the tormentor or the tormented actually knew what was going on. Thus, when Auschwitz was discovered, immediate common sense idea from the non-totalitarian world was, you know, what is the possible crime that these people could have done that justified them being in this camp in the first place? point is that common sense can't grapple such a thing like this. The Nazis demonstrated acts that the human imagination could not even come up with. They demonstrated that through totalitarian movements you can manufacture such evil and cruel acts. And according to Rent, this dehumanization, this disappearing of the victims of concentration camps, is required by three steps that the Nazis take. The first is the destruction of the juridical man inside of a person. The thing that bounds man to the law of the state. We saw this with the stateless people, where they were no longer considered a part of the nation and thus were not bound to any laws, and thus they were dealt outside the law as well. The concentration camps weren't meant for criminals who were convicted of a law as part of the system. None of those were prisons. The concentration camps were for people who, whether they committed a law or not, were put into those camps. And according to Arendt, the Nazis' goal was to make uh, it's such that the concentration camps house all innocent people, no one who had any kind of guiltiness upon them. Quote, the destruction of man's rights, the killing of the juridical person in him is a prerequisite for dominating him entirely. Once the juridical man is uh, put aside, the Nazis then deal with the moral man. This is done by making martyrdom impossible. When there is no social relations, when there is no witnesses to what you're doing, then your acts become meaningless. Death becomes anonymous. It, it, death is robbed of its meaning of having put a seal on a fulfilled life. Death instead becomes a seal that the person had never really existed in the first place. Quote, when a man is faced with the alternative of betraying and thus murdering his friends, or of sending his wife and children to their death, and even suicide would mean the immediate murder of his own family, how is he to decide? The alternative is no longer between good and evil, but between murder and murder. According to Rent, when the moral part of a person is destroyed, there's no conscience to determine what is right and what is wrong. And finally, when the moral person is destroyed, there's one last uh, 
entity within a person that needs to be destroyed, and that's his individuality. This attack starts right from the beginning when people are loaded into trucks or packed into like cattle car and chunted back and forth over the countryside for days on end. Their heads are shaved, allocated camp clothing, and are subjected to the methods of the camp. Quote, the aim of all these methods in any case is to manipulate the human body in such a way as to make it destroy the human person as inexorably as do certain mental diseases of organic origin. Thus, the experience of concentration camps demonstrates that humans can be treated in such a way that they can devolve and feel themselves as insignificant as an animal. It shows that man's nature is only something as long as he is able to put something into the world himself. According to Rent, the fact that there were so little revolts within the concentration camps themselves just represents how the juridical, moral, and individual part of a man was destroyed. Quote, for to destroy individuality is to destroy spontaneity, man's power to be something new out of his own resources, something that cannot be explained on the basis of reactions to environment and events. Nothing remains of man except the Pavlovian dog, who is willing to put the noose around his neck at the sound of a bell. Quote, without concentration camps, without the undefined fear they inspire and the very well-defined training they offer in totalitarian domination, a totalitarian state can neither inspire its nuclear troops with fanaticism nor maintain a whole population in complete apathy. The totalitarian regime can only gain absolute power if it can dominate every individual. That is, the individuality of every individual. Quote, any neutrality, indeed any spontaneously given friendship, is from the standpoint of totalitarian domination just as dangerous as open hostility, precisely because spontaneity as such, with its incalculability, is the greatest of all obstacles in total domination over man. Thus, the goal of totalitarianism is to make man superfluous. And when common sense is destroyed, the only thing to replace it is the super sense that the totalitarian movement offers. This super sense again is the idea that they have found the keys of history, that they have determined that the track of history is to find the racially superior race of the Aryans and to make that come into being. In such a phantom world, common sense cannot take apart such an ideology. It is simply believed out of necessity. No facts are needed to justify this ideology at all. As long as it has the support of the masses, the totalitarian movement is really unstoppable. It is for the sake that totalitarianism must destroy common sense and human dignity, to remove any obstacles preventing the actualization of this fictitious world. And thus, totalitarian ideologies don't aim to transform the world itself, but to transform the nature of man. This is exactly what the concentration camps were designed to do. Quote, until now, the totalitarian belief that everything is possible seems to have proved only that everything can be destroyed. Yet, in their effort to prove that everything is possible, totalitarian regimes have discovered without knowing it that there are crimes which men can neither punish nor forgive. The Holocaust is like no other crime in the past. We can't put it on the spectrum of crimes that we consider crimes today, unless it's not forgivable. It's something that is really, we need a new faculty of understanding to really comprehend. Quote, when the impossible was made possible, it became the unpunishable, unforgivable, absolute evil, which could no longer be understood and explained by the evil motives of self-interest, greed, covetousness, resentment, lust for power, and cowardice, in which therefore anger could not revenge, love could not endure, friendship could not forgive. And if we look at the philosophical tradition, we see many philosophers trying to answer the question whether there's radical evil, whether there's pure evil that exists. Many philosophers have rationalized it as that many people just have perverted ill wills or certain desires. But according to Rent, the Nazi movement, the totalitarian movements, they cannot be explained in this way. Quote, therefore, we actually have nothing to fall back on to understand a phenomenon that nevertheless confronts us with its overpowering reality and breaks down all standards we know. According to Arendt, there's only one thing that is discernible. We may say that radical evil has emerged in connection with a system in which all men have become equally superfluous. And that's chapter 12. It's a long chapter. Uh, very uh, have lots of admiration for you if you got through this whole video. Uh, this is actually the last chapter 
Um, not of not of the book, but the, of the first edition of the book. The the next chapter is actually not so long. It's something that was added later and uh, is 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 actually very important. And so I hope you join us for the last chapter. And uh, I hope you enjoy this chapter as well. Put any comments or questions you might have below. Have a great day.